The antidote to financial totalitarianism is more banks. And are you ready for 2008 on steroids? Coming up on today's Citizens Report. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 9th of May 2024. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party leader and founder Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. Good to be here. Yep. And on today's show, uh, now we might be known as those guys that fight the big banks. Yes. We're very well known for that. Uh, but we're calling for more banks today because in order to break the stranglehold that the private banking monopoly has over this country, we actually need more banks. And we're going to give you some interesting perspectives on that um, from other voices. And then we're going to give a review of recent developments in um, the global financial crash, which is ongoing, but which is coming to a head and ask some questions about why there are not, why this is not in the front pages and on all the headlines, because the situation is absolutely incredible. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Um, now, don't forget to hit the like button, make a comment below, engage as much as you can in circulating and sharing this video to get the word out. Um, you can find various links below, particularly with the campaigns and updates that we're going to mention before we get into the topics proper. Uh, and please hit the donate button if you can, because that's the only way we can continue to be here every well, week. Well, that's my job in between these shows, Elisa, is you know, helping to raise the money, but also spend the money and <laughs> every dollar that we raise is spent towards the, mm. the political activism that you see with Robbie traveling around the country, publication of literature, as much as we possibly do being on YouTube and the social media. So any dollars that come in, now mm. we don't get sponsorship from the government, we don't get corporate sponsorship, we don't get any bank money sponsors. any any money from the banks, <laughs> no. right? Because <laughs> it means that we have the ability then to speak our mind, to say what is truthful, we're not compromised mm. in any way. So if you can help, any yeah. amount helps. There's a huge amount of background work, obviously, oh, that huge. goes on day by day, hour by hour to make, um, you know, the morsels that we put out possible uh, and the information that can help well, people especially fight. All the, especially all the series you've been writing on the austerity packages, you know, the nine-part series or whatever it was, then the four-part uh, case studies that you've done on the whole, you know, neoliberalism takedown mm. of the country. And now you've done a whole other series on researching the history of the banking in this country, which is all available to our members yeah, and people. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit today, mm. actually, in a moment in the first topic. But before we get to that, just a few announcements. Now, uh, Robbie's not on a plane flying anywhere today, but he's no. currently on the train. If he, well, he missed the first one, he's trying to get to uh, this event to uh, support Dave McBride in time. Um, that's down in Morty Alec. And we put out a media release about um, this today because, uh, sorry, two days ago, um, the sentencing for David McBride will occur next Tuesday on the 14th. And we want people to call um, the Attorney General Dreyfus's office and that the rally today will be in the front of his office. And they're calling for 500 people to turn out. In fact, we'll put up a little quick little video in the background while we're talking of this. Um, with one of the posters saying uh, that he's wanted for hunting generals because um, far from just exposing the war crimes in Afghanistan, um, everything that he exposed goes way beyond that and he's actually um, primarily exposing the absolute corruption at the very top levels of the military, um, which has scapegoated various lower down people in the military to save from actually reforming the system. So this is a really important um, uh, service to this country that David McBride has performed and so, he deserves so to be rewarded, not punished and yeah. put in jail for ha the government's calling for uh, a lo lengthy period with a minimum of two years, no parole. But um, the, um, the push from the um, Crown Prosecutor is that a two year sentence wouldn't reflect the seriousness of the offending. So this is, rally is taking place outside the uh, the court next Tuesday. Oh it's, yeah, that's another one next Tuesday. I should say. Yes, Sorry, yeah. yeah. And that's uh, up in Canberra, isn't it? Yeah, that's the one where they want five hundred people. Yeah, up in Canberra next yeah. Tuesday. If you can make it, 
and, and, so, and this is why the, uh, the calls were for 500 people. Yeah, that's right. Now, also, um, Daniel Duggan, who has been uh, another person who has been caught up in our dangerous ally America's campaign to pitch us in a war against China, uh, his sentencing, uh, sorry, his extradition hearing is in just over two weeks, I believe, and these are for 11 year old allegations. He's been sitting in prison in solitary since October 2022. I mean, so, you know, he hasn't been charged with anything yet. It's 11 year old allegations. His family's suffering. Of course, you know, this is in parallel to what we have with Julian Assange, who's been sitting for five years in Belmarsh, hasn't had a trial, hasn't been convicted. You know, we're accusing other countries of incredible human rights, rights violations, and yet this is what we and our allies do. How can you leave someone locked up for that long without having gone through due process? Um, but we attended, uh, our, our activists in Queensland did an excellent job this week, and we'll put some pictures up. Uh, where they attended um, the Labor Day rally in Brisbane, uh, marching with the um, media union representation to in support and rallying for Julian Assange. And you'll see in the pictures there, um, Julian's father, John Shipton, who was extremely happy uh, at the presence mm. that we showed, adding to the others that were there. But do everything you can to um, support these great Australians um, who deserve, as I said, to be not... Um, punished but rewarded as whistleblowers and and um, truth tellers. So that's by way of announcement. Into the first topic, the antidote to financial totalitarianism is more banks. Now, look, the gist of what we're saying here, Craig, is that uh, as you know, and you've been talking at, at our various seminars around the country, and in fact, we should put a call out for those people who haven't yet attended and who um, can, we'll put up a calendar which you can see the links below where you can attend a seminar in our, uh, in various states to meet the Australian Citizens Party, to meet Craig and his wife Nolene, the founders of the party and hear from Robert Barwick and others. Um, but we've been focusing, you've been talking in your presentations about how Australia is locked into a neoliberal system and this the policies that are taken as, you know, not challengeable, they're a fait accompli of privatisation, deregulation, free trade. You know, this is the framework we live in. It's like we know nothing else. Well, uh, yeah, listen, I'll go through somewhat. Look, in the last 40 years, we've been taken over by a secret, secret British cult called the Montpellier Society. It was a deliberate and very cunning, secretive plan to bring in what we call neoliberalism today. Every single thing... The privatisations, deregulations was on the on the on their target list, going back into the 70s, and it was kept hidden. Hidden. People don't understand that this stuff was brought into our country deliberately, yeah. to, in order to loot the population. And now we've got an entire generations mm. that are deprived of housing, yes. education, and so forth. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention that because it's these um, policies, this framework that has set up the cost of living crisis today. We're basically paying young people today, and everyone today, are basically paying for all of those economic policy mistakes mm. that have destroyed, as we showed with the Kennedy example in a, a show a few weeks ago and in the series you mentioned. And that's what you these know, for, this is what these forums are about. They're about, yeah. as you said, meeting us, putting... Because we used to do this before COVID, you know, used to go around the country. We used to have hundreds of people come to our meetings. Now, this time we're doing it again. We're doing it in every state. We've just got next... The, the last one's coming up next Sunday here in Deer Park. That we've had three in Victoria. We've had close to 400 people, a series of these things around the country. And the issue is to understand the nature of our political and economic enemies, which, which is not talked mm. about. Yeah. So these forums allow people to be up, brought up to date about the international circumstances we find ourselves in. Robbie gives updates on what we're politically doing. Mm. Nolene talks about the brainwashing of the generations over the last 50 to 100 years, mm. how that's been a deliberate program. And I talk about specifically where we've come from as an organisation, mm. what we've been fighting against. And mm. we've been doing this now for 36 years. These policies of neoliberalism is what we fight against and yeah. give people a real sense that the Citizens Party represents the potential for the future changes necessary 
in our country to go back to what actually worked. Yeah, no, it's important to develop that deep background so that when you go to meet your member of parliament to talk about these issues, you can raise, you know, with today's issues, like why are we paying so much for electricity? Well, what we sold off, we flogged off all of our electricity systems, we carved it up, you know, we broke it all down. Um, it's now a disaster. And I wanted to refer to this article uh, that Glenn Isherwood came across the other day from the end of March in ABC News. It was headlined, This Isn't the 30s I Was Promised. And it, they interviewed a whole bunch of young Australians, well, people in their 30s, and they're people that, um, you know, had plans. They wanted to buy somewhere to live, they wanted to start a family, they wanted to start a business or whatever they wanted to do and they've had to put it all on hold because they just can't even make ends meet, let alone go into any of those endeavours. Uh, and so the article shows how y young Aussies, and I'll put up this graph in the background, young Aussies are caught in a perfect storm of soaring costs of housing, healthcare, other essential expenses, debt, including there's a big part on the HEX debt problems um, and increasing tax rates combined with stagnated income. So their income hasn't increased commensurately. commensurately. Uh, and so the article says that today's 30 and 34 year olds are the first generation in nearly 50 years where most people don't own a house. It's even worse, they said, than during the 1990s recession when house prices were, of course, at least much lower despite the high interest rates. Can't even get rents these days. Well, that's right. You, you know, it's, it's a fight to find somewhere to rent. And if you're on the lower end of the income brackets, you'll miss out. Um, but the article said, as this graph shows, that in 1990, the average mortgage was about eight, it was about three times the yearly wage for a 34-year-old. Now it's eight times. Mm. So this, is, this shocking state of affairs is actually quite lawful as a result of the policies we've pursued. We've dug ourselves into this hole that we're in by shutting down the economy, stripping the economy, and that has been facilitated, facilitated by the setup of a banking system which does not support the economy, it does not support economic growth, on the contrary, it smothers economic growth and that has been a deliberate policy. And I wanted to mention a uh, article that I've just read which talks about that very thing. Uh, it was contributed to by some, a fellow some people of our listeners would have heard of, Professor Richard Werner, who's a German banking expert based at mm -hmm. Oxford University. And he, we cited him a lot during the fight to uh, stop the government banning cash transactions yeah. because he's a big defender of cash. But he's also a big defender of banks and having lots of them because Germany, where he's from, still has around 1,500 publicly owned banks and they're all different banks locally based. So they're not big chains that have them everywhere uh, necessarily. There's a lot of local banks and they support 70% of German deposits or they host 70% of German deposits and provide over 90% of lending to SMEs, so small, medium sized enterprises. The German economy is built upon what's called the middle stunt, you know, the middle layer of business, which means that with all these public banks, they are responsible for supporting the actual economy, the actual economic activity within the economy yeah. by supporting these businesses. Now, that doesn't happen in Australia mm. unless you're prepared to put your house literally up as collateral. There isn't any, and that's all done for the profit motive of these private bank banks that we have here. There's, there is no, and mm. this is where the difference comes in, Elisa, the profit motive of the private bank is completely different mm. to the profit motive of a public bank. Because there is no profit motive for a public bank. If they make a profit, it gets spent back into the community. Mm, exactly. Completely different. This is what you know, Ben Chifley and Curtin knew back in the 1930s. That's why in the 1950s they wanted to nationalise the banking system. Mm. Because they wanted to make sure that the control of credit was left in the hands of publicly controlled entities for the benefit of the general welfare mm. and development of the population through its economy. That was all shut down with the de, you know, the deregulation agenda that came in, starting in the early 70s. So everything we talk about neoliberalism has got is directly tied to the banks, mm. because neoliberalism basically means take the public credit, and public assets, and asset strip the public and put yeah, it in the hands of private yeah. control. 
And what's really interesting about his article, because it's actually about China, uh, it's called The Rise of the Red Dragon, The Non-Binary Political Economy of Decentralised Public Banks, and he's written it with two co-authors. Um, but he talks about how um, after communism came to an... Or, uh, after, you know, the... Um, the communist proper system came to an end in China. They took the best um, aspects of the free market and of the command economy. They basically had a hybrid approach where, and they looked at models around the world, at different models, and they were very, very familiar, which is not treated in the article, with the American system of political economy of Alexander mm -hmm. Hamilton and national credit banks. Um, Sun Yat-sen had been trained in that school in America. Um, so they developed a system which he said raised China's economy to the position it is today and raised um, people from poverty and so forth on a massive scale by creating a banking system. Um, they put it this way, the solution is public bank credit produced in decentralised fashion by many small and competing local banks but largely in public hands. They embarked on a project to create thousands of new banks ranging from a new national from new national champions from a few national champions to unaccountable small rural village or state level banks savings banks post banks credit cooperatives as well as specialized banks of all kind banks appeared like bamboo shoots <laughs> even after the 2008 global financial crisis when the rest of the world saw them disappear and he talked they talk a lot about the fact that uh, in most of the western countries banking is solely the domain of the private sector. Governments, of course, have made this rule that you don't enter into banking. And he talked about how Japan had used this model, but under the auspices of US hegemonic influence, they abandoned this approach. And even though Germany still has this banking tradition, um, which goes back a long way of having a lot of public banks, um, Europe, he said, has lost more than 5,000, mainly small banks in the past two decades, um, this is a deliberate scheme. Mario Draghi, the head of the European Central Bank at the time, said in 2016, the Eurozone has too many banks and they were the European Union was sponsoring what they called degrowth targets, justified in economic terms, um, where they said in order to reduce economic growth, it is helpful to reduce the number of banks, in the words of Werner and his colleagues. So in other words, do the opposite, have more banks and create economic growth. Mm. And of course, what we see across Australia, it, with the growing banking deserts, this is where our um, main flagship campaign comes in because of course, as everyone will know, we have been fighting the big four banks' um, efforts to close every rural and regional bank in the country. Um, now we have an update, which is that because People heard last week uh, Westpac has put a moratorium on further closures, but the Commonwealth Bank, which had done so earlier, has just announced that they're closing the bank at Butterham, which is in on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, and, of course, they pledged not to shut down any regional banks, and which everyone that knows Butterham says it's not metropolitan, but... As we put out in a media release today, and we'll put a link to this up uh, when it's available, uh, the Commonwealth Bank is um, you, its basically cherry-picking its definition. It's classing this bank branch as metropolitan because the University of Adelaide's Accessibility and Remoteness Index of Australia, the ARIA Index, which is generally used by the Bureau of Statistics and so forth to determine metro versus regional, um, puts it in that classification. But, um, you know, it's based on population. So when population grows in an area mm. like the Sunshine Coast, they well, say, you, you oh, well, that's you, now metro. You need more banks, not less. Well, exactly. <laughs> if you've got more population, something classified as metropolitan is usually, it's based on um, measures of availability of services as we go through in... Um, the media release, the ARIA website says, service centres with larger populations are assumed to contain a greater level of service provision. So here's the Commonwealth Bank justifying its shutdown because, oh, well, we only promised not to shut them down in regional areas and this is a metro area. And yet, because it is metro, they should be keeping it. They need it. This requires that service um, provision. Again, 
oh, there's more Australia Post outlets there, therefore we can just have our services put onto Australia Post, mm. which is a, more, a continuation of more of the same rot. Yeah, no. So um, on the 16th of this month, the committee uh, that heard, um, you know, across the country with 13 hearings in about as many months um, from all parts of Australia that the suffering, that untold suffering that they're going through, the um, damage that's being done to local communities, local communities shutting down as a result of the bank branches closing and everything else leaving town, they will put out their report and we'll see what they recommend. But in the meantime, there's another inquiry which we've um, just put out a media release about too on financial abuse. And this is being run by, um, it's a Labor chaired committee, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services. And we want you to put in a submission to that committee because even though um, financial abuse concerns mainly um, situations within families and um, in abuse type abusive relationships, there's another form of financial abuse which is conducted by banks mm. and there are millions of victims of banks which uh, the, this inquiry, which has quite a broad terms of reference, um, should be hearing about because it does encompass all kinds of financial abuse. Uh, and that those are the people in the local communities, like small businesses who are taking extra security risks by holding cash on hand because they can't go to the local bank. Um, they can't bank their cash. They can't go and get change for the till. Um, they have to, they've got extra expenses of travelling hundreds of kilometres or sending staff, paying staff to go and get cash and change. Um, and also vulnerable people who are getting targeted by scammers and can't go down to the bank branch to get advice, timely advice uh, to avoid that. So you're going to have a mammoth expansion of victims of financial abuse. Of course, we've already got a lot in this country on an industrial scale, as we heard from the Banking Royal Commission, of which bank um, uh, advocates have for bank victims have told us that they estimate fewer than 1% of all those bank victims have received financial mm. redress from the banks. So that's what this committee needs to be hearing about. Um, now, so we'll put details below, but yeah, please uh, flick an email or a letter to the committee if you've done so to the previous committee on that topic. On the good news front, talking about the necessity to have um, more banks, in the United States, uh, this last week, on the 30th of April, the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank, the NIB, and this is something that, of course, you know, we want here. Every country should have such a bank that funds infrastructure and development. The US, of course, absolutely desperately needs it with the level of their infrastructure collapse. Um, but this, um, there's a bill to create a national infrastructure bank on the table in the Congress with 33 sponsors. And this NIB coalition group, which is a lot of different organisations across the spectrum of left, right, etc., that are fighting for this bank, uh, they just held a, uh, a forum in Congress on, on Capitol Hill where 16 congressional officers sent representatives from both sides of the political fence to listen to the proposal and they heard from experts such as Naomi Prins, who's an author who's written extensively about the control of private banks and how we have to break that, uh, and Alfeka Mutadi, who's a former IMF economist who you know is absolutely brilliant on this subject of what a national infrastructure bank can do. It's a self-funding operation, um, exactly in the spirit of what Alexander Hamilton did with the First Bank of the United States to um, create the credit to put into building the nation. Again, well, the, these uh, congresswomen and uh, you know speakers, they're only bringing back policies that existed in the past. Mm. This is nothing new. No. And this is the, the thing is that we've taken this neoliberalism path you know, for several years and now it's all breaking down. We're coming back to the policies that work. Mm, exactly. And I'll just point to, um, finally, in this topic, the series that you mentioned earlier, um, which uh, we wanted to go back and look at what happened in 1959 when the Commonwealth Bank of Australia was split so that the central bank reserve, which became the Reserve Bank of Australia, was split away from the Commonwealth Bank's trading bank functions. 
Um, that was the beginning of, well, it had started earlier, but it was when we really gave uh, cent mm. the central bank fully independent and private control uh, of banking and oversight of all banking in this country, mm. um, which is something that had been dictated, as I wrote about in our austerity pamphlet, by uh, Montague Norman, the head of the Bank of England, and who worked with the Bank for in creating the Bank for International Settlements to create an eclectic club, as he put it, of central bankers. A from dictatorship, we call it. A, absolutely, a banker's dictatorship of all the um, prominent Western nations, Anglo-American um, dominated, of course, so that through each central bank in each nation, the orders could be delivered of what was acceptable or not through um, the banking sector as a whole. And in looking at the um, Hansard transcripts of weeks worth of debates from 1959 when this banking bill was debated, um, it was a stunt, there was a stunning array of politicians, senators and MPs, who most of, oh, many of whom I'd heard of from like Jim Cairns to mm -hmm. Gough Whitlam, but many others that I hadn't heard of, um, Labor stalwarts of the day who slammed what they called the monopoly banking system that Australia had. Um, one of the MPs, you know, because one of the big debates at this time and one of the reasons for this 1959 um, banking legislation was, of course, in 1949, Labor, the Labor Party had tried to nationalise the yeah. banks and it had been um, stopped cold. But um, lay, uh, when Menzies came in, the Liberal government kept saying, oh, you know, they're going to try to nationalise the banks again. We have to take away that capability by setting up an independent reserve bank of Australia. Um, but one of the senators actually said that what Menzies and co are trying to do is nationalisation of banking in the interests of the private banks. Yeah. So, you know, concentrating all control of banking into the hands of this small club of bankers. Um, and so I urge people, we'll put a link below, I urge you to download the PDF of this series, which are mostly excerpts from the Hansard of the day um, with you know some background and so forth. And you'll see um, like Senator, this week's instalment was Senator Sid O'Flaherty, who gave an extensive speech on the control of um, the con control that the British headquart mostly British headquartered banks had over the Australian banks or so-called Australian banks, but also over all the media outlets. And he goes through them, names them, and chapter and verse the connections they have into big business in the country. Really stunning. And this is, you know, all off the top of his head. All he had as a prop was one graph that showed some of the interconnections. Um, so you can read about that. Uh, you can read about Senator Theo Nichols, who um, one of the interesting things he pointed to was the fact that he said at that time there were nine banks in Australia, which was down from 70 banks in 1850. But then he said, you know, we'll probably be left in years to come with one or two. <laughs> got four. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but you know, it just goes to show why we need more banks, uh, as they were indeed advocating at the time. And the other interesting thing, because the other debate that took place was over section 11. So section 11, which, uh, at, and um, you know, this was why we were motivated to put out this series, of course, is that Treasurer Jim Chalmers, with his RBA reforms, which are on hold, fortunately, they're on ice at the moment because there was such a hue and cry about it. Um, but one of the things they wanted to strip out of our existing RBA reform legislation, which is what, you know, was put to bed in 1959, still included this clause, um, section 11, which gave uh, the government authority, if it came down to a fight between the Reserve Bank and the government, it gave them the supreme authority over the, um, over the bank. The which government, elected government, has to have that power. Yeah, which came out of the 1930 fight yes. between Ted Theodore and, and uh, you know, the Commonwealth Bank at that time under Sir Robert Gibson, where he was trying to expand the credit to, you know, to, to deal with deflation and so forth, the prices. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sir Robert Gibson basically said, no, 
we, we will not take your instruction. Even though you're the elected government of the day, we're going to do our own thing. Mm. So Curtin and Chifley made sure that Section 11 was written into the Banking Act so that wherever there's a dispute, it's the government that has the, right, the responsibility to make the decision, not mm. private bankers. And even, even at that time, it was a public bank, it was a Commonwealth bank, but it was, unfortunately it was under domination and the influence of yeah. these private bankers. So the 1937 Royal Commission, after that whole fight, said in black and white, mm -hmm. the government is the final um, stopping point on you know any disputes. And that's why Chalmers wants to throw it out. Like he's a child of the neoliberalism experiment. Let's call yeah. it an experiment because it's failing. These economists of these days come through universities that teach nothing else but neoliberalism economics. And therefore he says, oh, we don't need this, you know, because they don't even understand, they haven't even considered, mm. and they don't want to, what the alternative is, mm. which is public banking. And funnily enough, in the 1959 debates, that issue from the 1937 Royal Commission of whether the government should have the authority was obviously raised and debated, do we need this clause in there? Do we keep that in there? Because it had been in there from the 1945 banking legislation. And even um, the guy who was representing the Treasury at that particular point, um, Senator Spooner, so he was Menzies' guy, he even said, you know, look, ultimately the government has to have the right to disagree with the bank and have the final say. And another government senator, John McCallum, said this. He said, in the final resort, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer are supreme in relation to the Governor of the Reserve Bank. So it's interesting that even on that side, um, they were sticking with this. Uh, and you, you can hear also from Senator Nick McKenna from Tasmania, and I call him Senator Nick McKim's namesake <laughs> from of old, from times of old, um, because they had a similar passion for fighting for... Um, to diffuse the power of the banks and, and even in, he contested the legislation to split up the bank, Commonwealth Bank, you know, mm -hmm. they all, old Labor wanted to keep it as it was and he, he made, made similar arguments to what we've raised and others have raised in the hearing that was held by this committee today um, in, in this day and age uh, when, remember, Peter Costello and um, Bernie Fraser and all these aficionados all challenged why do we even need this? No one's calling for it. And Senator Nick McKenna said back then, he said, where is the need for this 1959 legislation? We've got perfectly good legislation from 1945. Um, he said the central bank's not calling for any changes. That mean the, um, you know, the central bank function within the Commonwealth Bank is not calling for it. The people aren't calling for it. No one's been calling for it. Only the private banks. And one of the things he exposed when he went through the control of the bankers and that others exposed was how the banks had openly said that they'd funded Menzies' election mm. um, in opposition to Labor's plans to nationalise the banks. Yep. So it's really, really fascinating to read and to situate what the stakes are today when you look at what uh, Treasurer Jim Chalmers and Labor, you know, you know, these old Labor stalwarts would be rolling over in their grave to see what the Labor Party is doing today to sell, you know, down the, yeah. down the plug hole, um, the last vestiges of what Labor fought for to keep um, elected uh, representatives having the final say over banking in this country. So yeah. do read that. But we're not going to change away from banking. We're going to um, drill down even further in our next topic. Before you, before uh, oh, yeah? You, yeah, before you jump in, you've been referring to this publication a lot. I mean, you've been flicking backwards and forwards. That's how much we, you rely and we rely on this publication. If you want a copy, you should call in for one. Get a free copy, we'll email it to you. Mm. But, I mean, that's, this is what we do. This is the depth of the research that goes into what we talk about is all in writing. It's not, we're not just talking off the top of our head. Well, you're definitely Well, we not. are, but... <laughs> well, we are, but it's, but it's backed, backed up. up yeah. yeah. So you can read the detail and it's all sourced and footnoted yeah. and, you know, you can trace back the, um, the sources for it. All right. Are you ready for 2008 on steroids? <laughs> Now, um, no, I'm not. Because <laughs> we don't know what's well, going to happen. No one is really, because um, the only way to be ready for it is to preempt it by doing exactly what we talked about in the first segment, which is to completely rewrite the rules of our banking system and, um, yeah, change it all up and have public banking, have a government um, national infrastructure bank of some capacity, 
have a public post office bank where people can know that their savings will be safe, that they can't be bailed in. Um, you know, bail in, of course, being the new invention after the 2008 global financial crisis to uh, reliquify or reliquidate -re banks by stealing money from depositors and from bondholders and so forth. Um, but I wanted to say at the outset, because uh, and we, we're not talking about it in depth today, but again, we've got a lot on it in our Australian Alert Service this week, and we do every week, um, and that is the war drive. And the, the driver for war is the reality that an alternative economic system is on the table, has been put on the table by not just major countries like China and Russia, but by the majority of the world's population living in nations um, that are orienting to the BRICS approach, China and Russia and India, South Africa, uh, Brazil, that, and uh, you know, the other countries that have been recruited to it that are trying to create a new fair economic framework and trading arrangements and so forth. Um, and given that the financial system of the Anglo-American establishment is going down the gurgler, and we're mm -hmm. going to show you that in a moment, um, they don't want to see a new alternative, much more popular system rising. And so wars in the Middle East, for instance, which is a key connecting region, connecting the Belt and Road Initiative and other initiatives that are uh, being unrolled throughout Eurasia into Africa and into Europe, and Europe has shown in recent decades a propensity to want to collaborate uh, with China and with Russia. But of course, then you have, oh, we can't work with Russia because, you know, Ukraine, etc. Now you can't work with China because X, Y, Z. So, you know, it's all an attempt to sabotage this. And Elbridge Colby made this really clear, actually, in a tweet that he put out. Elbridge Colby is a former advisor to the National Security Agency under Trump. Um, and he's, he wrote a book where he basically said, look, you know, we want to spark a war between China and Taiwan because that will stop the rise of China. Mm. That'll, and it's the same as with Ru what Russia is having to do with Ukraine. Mm. It's distracting them from what they should be doing and working on this new um, economic renaissance that they, they're trying to roll out. But he was responding to an article um, in The Diplomat which basically said that... Um, you know, this alternative economic system is is becoming real, it's coming to life, mm. and that this could rewrite the rules of the entire economic order. And, and he had this little tweet freaking out saying, oh, if China dominates the economy, forget US hegemony. So the real fight, as, as we've long said, the real war is between the failing Anglo-American hegemon and the rising global majority representing 85% of the world's population. And this has been written about, we've written about this in the alert service. You know, there's a, a classic uh, term for this that we've been using called the Thucydides trap. Now, Thucydides was a general going back to the, um, the wars between Sparta and Athens, right? And you had one rising power, which was Athens, and you had a collapsing ancient power, which was Sparta. And right throughout the last you know, 2,000 years, you've had about 12 or 13 instances where a falling power has resorted to war to try and maintain its status quo. And that's the trap. Yeah, no, exactly. And the difference here today, though, is that, you know, what China is doing, you know, they are saying, we'll include you. We don't, you don't have to collapse and destroy yourselves in the world um, and throw the chessboard over. Um, you know, join our system. It's an all-inclusive approach. All right, so yeah, now I want to develop a little bit uh, the evidence of recent times of the fact that this financial system is finished. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the financial order that the Anglo-American hegemon is trying to protect is dead, it's finished. It can't be revived actually, and therefore they ought to let go of it and cooperate with China and other countries. Um, and as I said at the start of the show, um, why, when you, when you listen to what I'm about to go through, <laughs> you have to ask yourself, why is this not in all of the headlines? It's, you know, it's pretty shocking, actually. Um, because remember, last year in the United States, we saw the second, third and fourth 
biggest bank collapses since the Great Depression. We saw the collapse of Credit Suisse, this mm. giant. Don't forget that. Now this year, uh, we've just seen the collapse of the first regional bank in the United States for 2024. That's Republic First Bank Corp, which failed, and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, organised a takeover by another bank. It had $4.3 billion in deposits. So these are what they call their small or regional banks, but they're not really all that small. Um, and you've also got New York Community Bank Corp, which we've talked about before on the show, which has been in, a tr in trouble for a while, and it's in a holding pattern. It had been one of the ones to rescue Signature Bank last year. Um, it, it's in a holding pattern because it's basically been bailed out by a number of, like a billion dollars was pumped in by big investment funds. Um, other factors are that the Fed program to assist regional bank liquidity, which they started a year ago, expired this March. Um, and, but all the same uh, problems that created this outburst are still there, such as the ri rising interest rates, and they haven't started coming down yet. Bank deposits remain low. People are nervous about putting their money in the bank bank lending is still in decline. So you don't have money going into the economy um, to cause economic growth. You have a commercial real estate crisis. 25% of all the US, of the assets of all the US banks are in commercial real estate worth some $3.7 trillion. Delinquency rates have tripled uh, over the last year. Um, now, Jerome Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve on the 7th of March, had said regarding that problem, there will be bank failures, but he claimed it wouldn't be the big banks. <laughs> now, that was contradicted by the chair of the FDIC at the time, Martin Gruenberg, who said that non, the non-current rate for non-owner occupied commercial real estate loans, meaning the loans that are not being paid, is now at its highest level since the first quarter of 2014, driven by portfolios at the largest banks. So, you know, he's saying it is the big banks. In January, a report came out. This was uh, published by the American Enterprise Institute, which said that the, the US Federal Reserve is, quote, operating at a loss, deeply technically insolvent and with asset shortfalls. Um, the Federal Reserve has negative capital with um, seven trillion dollars of debt instruments, mainly treasuries, at very low interest rates. So it's got the same exact situation as Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank and all those ones um, had last year because they've got all these um, treasuries on their books. That's their assets, but they're completely mm -hmm. undervalued and they can't, if they sell them, they'll have to sell them at a loss. So these are called unrealized losses and the the Fed has a trillion dollars worth of those unrealized losses. Um, now this position, because the Fed has to hold them to maturity, it can't sell them and lose money, limits it at the same time from conducting certain types of monetary operations that it uses for monetary policy, including operations which help the liquidity of other banks in trouble. So the lender of last resort is in trouble, is in trouble and there's no outside lender that can come in to rescue it. Except the federal government yeah. instituting a public bank or a Hamiltonian bank. Well, that's right. As I said, <coughs> the system's finished unless you actually radically overhaul it. Mm. Now, um, add to that, the IMF's 2024 Global Financial Stability Report warned about the volatile US Treasury market itself. So this is US government debt. That's yep. what treasuries are that that market could represent a threat to the entire global financial system because as we've been reporting for a few years now in the Australian Alert Service, hedge funds now control the US Treasury markets. Hedge funds, of course, are private banks that often take money only from the most rich individuals and they make the most uh, risky speculative investments at very high leverage. So they don't have the money to play with, it's borrowed money and they're putting it into risky speculative um, forms of contracts like financial derivatives contracts, which are just literally betting on things, on interest rate and um, Speculation. differences yeah. in different rates and things. 
But this is what the IMF report said. A concentration of vulnerability has built up as a handful of highly leveraged funds account for most of the short positions in Treasury futures. So basically, um, uh, the Treasury's market has been handed to, it, it usually it's been handed to gamblers. Um, and this is what creates, I mean, the, the US Treasury market is known as the deepest, most liquid market in the world. Mm. But it, it's not anymore, and it's deteriorated to such a degree that even some of the biggest banks um, won't go near it. So the mm. hedge funds are the ones that doing, are doing the trading. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But put it this way, eight or fewer very large, highly leveraged speculative hedge funds hold some 30% of all futures positions on 5, 10 and 20 year treasury securities and 50% of all futures positions on two year treasuries. Now, add to that oh. that the U.S. Treasury is still pumping out more debt. I mean, as we know, the U.S. has something like $34 trillion in debt. It, it, it just, it's pumping out more. Um, and the problem is it doesn't have the economy it once had to back it up. So the Treasury is projecting a total of $1.84 trillion of net new U.S. debt for the first three quarters of 2024. So some of that's already been issued, some of it's obviously coming, but $1.84 trillion. Um, and remember, they have to pay interest on mm. all of that debt. Mm. And Bloomberg had a report where they said that in March, the Treasury was paying out $2 million a minute <laughs> on to their debt holders, to the holders of this debt. Um, and it, and in this context, an advisory panel to the Treasury, which includes BlackRock and JP Morgan Chase, so who put these guys in charge of the advisory panel? Well, go figure. Um, they're advising the creation of new types of securities for the Fed to overcome this problem. So it's always the same. Mm. The solution involves more of the problem that created the situation in the first place. Um, and look, this has been building since 2008 because um, there was no commitment to actually really seriously evaluate what went wrong in 2008. So rather than solving the problem, um, that, that crash, the crash of 2008 never finished. It just continued. It was shoved under the carpet for a while and every now and again you see it emerge. Well, it's coming up. The whole thing's about to unfurl and all the crap that was underneath is about well, to go everywhere. We made calls internationally for the idea of Glass-Steagall, which was a separation of all of the speculative stuff you've talked about from the actual necessary commercial banking system, mm. that there be a complete barrier from all of the speculation affecting the real economy. Now, of course, if that had been put into place, I mean, Glass-Steagall was taken down in effectively 2000, I think it was by Bill Clinton, uh, it was got rid of, mm. so you'd be able to have you'd be able to have more and more speculation in the banking system, in the financial system. If that was returned, say in two thousand and eight, Clinton since said he made a mistake. He, he, didn't, he thought it was the wrong thing to do, but nothing's been changed. Not, it has never been no, dealt with. No. So you've got this. You've got even more betting, betting on bets on bets by these effectively financial mm. casino operators like BlackRock and JP Morgan Chase and so forth, because that's what they all are with their huge yeah, derivatives holdings. That's right. And nothing's changing. And I was going to say, talking about BlackRock again, because um, one of the major points of evolution since 2008 came in August 2019 at the Jackson Hole meeting of central bankers where BlackRock proposed what they called financial regime change, which is where you put bankers in control of government policy, such as fiscal policy and spending decisions, um, and Mark Carney essentially backed that up from other angles, um, in order to uh, grease the path for that, you had the big blow up in 2019 in the repo market, and the same thing blew up again during COVID in March 2020. And the Fed, and there was a call at that time for the Fed and Treasury to work together to coordinate fiscal policy and monetary policy, but not under government control, okay. under the control of technocrats and independent central bankers. And since then, a new standing repurchase facility was created by the Fed for when, for instance, the repo repurchase market freezes up, which is part of the liquidity between um, banks and governments and so forth that uh, allows the banks on a day-to-day -day basis to settle accounts and so forth. 
Now you've brought hedge funds as the biggest players into that repo treasury market um, operation. Um, not to mention, you know, the big cloud hanging it over over it all, which is a quadrillion dollars according to the Bank for International Settlements plus in speculative derivatives that's all going to come uh, collapsing down. But the, the solution proposed uh, by the International Monetary Fund in a blog that came out on the 18th of March is to give private banks and independent central bankers even more control mm. and effectively really um, uh, bearing down on this financial dictatorship. In their, this blog post, they said that our recent review of supervisory approaches found that the ability and will to act remain critical and can suffer from unclear mandates or inadequate legal powers, resources, and uh, unclear independence, as well as powerful financial sector lobbies. Policy makers need to better empower banking supervisors to act early and with authority if needed. And this is the same reason why we saw Jim Chalmers' RBA mm -hmm. legislation to give more power to the central bank, that they know the crisis is coming as well as anyone does, and they have to have the power when the system comes down to grab everything, steal everything and save their system. And we can't let it happen. To allow the government to use the power of public credit, that is, look, we pay our taxes. You know, we want to see something happen with those taxes. You know, the government has a tremendous capacity to provide for the public good. That was stolen and the whole idea of this, the, aust the austerity is to make sure that the public pays, mm -hmm. public pays these private institutions. There's nothing, there's no rocket science around this. Now here in Victoria, you know, we have all these railway line removal projects, right? We have all sorts of infrastructure being developed. The budget's being, I think, had, uh, handed down today as we speak, or it might've been handed down in the last 24 hours. I haven't caught up with it, but I have seen that they intend to cut back on all that development because, oh, it's becoming, the debt's becoming too big. Mm. The debt's not the problem. The problem is where and how that debt is funded. If it's done through the private banking system, which is what most yeah. debt is done through now, of course you're gonna be paying a premium in interest and so forth because the private bankers wanna have their pound of flesh. They've gotta get it. They're, they're not interested in the public, they're only interested in their private profits. If you had a public bank, the debt doesn't mean anything because it is governed and guaranteed by the people, mm -hmm. the taxpayers, the activity of the people. We need ro uh, rail crossings removed in this state because if, if you've ever been in some of our roads just around our office here, when the boom boats go down and get stuck, mm. and, or even if they operate normally, the amount of time, energy and so forth that you've got to spend in those traffic queues is enormous. And you multiply that by 150 times throughout Melbourne, the economic wastage is enormous. Mm -hmm. Have a public bank, you provide the credit, you amortise it over 30 years, mm. right? You don't have that problem. But that power is what the private banks want for themselves. Oh, absolutely. And the, and the wild thing is that most states, as I understand it, have treasury investment corporations that could issue the bonds tomorrow to fund all of this in a sovereign capacity. And we only owe the debt to ourselves. Uh, and the constitutionally, that ability of states to do that is protected. Yeah, and like we've talked about regard to funding things like public housing, it can be done immediately if yeah. we decide to do it. Well, but the neoliberal agenda says, no, you can't have big government, you can't have the yeah. control of the, the finances and the credit in the hands of an elected government it's that dangerous. can direct it for the people. It's dangerous for the private sector. That's why they <laughs> wanted to nationalise the banks back in the 50s, right? Because this is the issue, and it's now the issue globally, and I think with the rise of the global south or the global majority, mm. you're seeing more and more of a call for the policies of that what we call the American system of political economy, which has no status in this country at all, but was the, 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 uh, the, the economic policies that we use for the development of the United States, development of Japan and other places like Germany, mm. Those policies are coming back mm. through the global majority the, or the global south, however you want to, whatever terminology you want to use, they're coming back. And that's why you're getting, that's as the you good said, news. 
it's a good news, and that's why we're getting the push for war, yep. from the Western, Anglo-American Western countries, including us. We're on the wrong side of the fence here. Yeah, no, and our shifting it from within um, the enemy camp would make a huge impact. Yep. So keep fighting for these issues. Talk to your MP about these banking matters on whatever front you like. There's plenty of ways you can intersect them and local councils and so forth. Um, not only is this coming up for debate about needing a public bank at the um, local government association meeting mid-year, but the CWA in New South Wales, mm -hmm. one of our activists, put it on the agenda to be debated there. So all those kind of um, conduits to get it on the table, take them, let us know, and stay involved. And, and yeah, stay involved, come to the, the forums. forums yeah. Contact us for the alert, subscribe if you can get it. That all supports us to keep the fight going. Yep. So that's it for this week. Thanks okay. for tuning in. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Lisa. See you again next week. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.